Good morning. Aren't you glad to be represented by pastors and missionaries who are on the ground in countries like that? That's amazing. We're going to pray for them soon. Just a couple announcements, and uh, then I'll pray, and then we have a couple testimonies. Uh, so first announcement, um, membership class begins uh Wednesday, March 9th at 6.30 p.m. in the Education Conference Room. There is space for more, so if you're interested in finding out more about what the church believes, please sign up with Pastor Grady. Crisis Care Kits. If you'll notice, we have some of these pink and green signs for Crisis Care Kits. We're going to be holding these out for about six weeks. If you want to pick them up, they're in the foyer right here uh, by the, uh, behind the, the, the tech area. And uh, if you drop them off, they'll have, uh, they'll have the supply list and just one little stuffed animal in there. And they'll be over in the corner with some banana boxes. We'll be holding these out for about six weeks. So mid-April is, is when we're going to send them off. It's been a good morning in church so far, yes? Yeah. I just am thrilled. All right. So how many have ever heard of Mad Libs? You know what they are? Uh, raise your hand if you do not know what Mad Libs are. Because will make a, John, are you? He spent so much time in theologi theological study in preschool that he missed out on Mad Libs. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so Mad Libs are so fun. They're a little story, so I'll show you. They're different, they're just a, a little booklet of different stories, but there's um, a lot of grammatical words left out and so you ask for the words and then you write them in and then you read the story does that make sense yeah the person doesn't know what the story's about and so it just makes a really fun story so we're gonna try it really quick it's really really short it's like okay so i need just call it out i need the name of a famous person who john cena okay all right Yep. Oh, I know who he is. Okay. He does the garbage bag commercials. Okay. And and movies. I need a verb. Okay. I need a noun. And I need another noun. What was the first one? Okay. So there. I'm gonna write McDonald's because we already have an. Okay, so now, here's our story, ready? John Cena loved us so much that he ran on the dog to save us from our McDonald's. <laughs> now that is a mad lib, okay? Now, why would I share that with you? Because sometimes when we are sharing Jesus with other people, we use big words that have been named Christianese words that only someone that grew up in the church would know, and we're trying to tell this person this very simple story about somebody that loved us so much, and what they can do for them, and the hope that they can have for the future, but they have no clue what we're saying, because it sounds like we're talking in Mad Libs, because we either use big words that, that they don't know, or we... We, we know what he did for us, but we haven't really practiced verbalizing that to people and share. This is why I love this with, with what you're doing with testimonies. People are learning to share their stories. And when the stories are relatable and in language that we understand, it hits the heart, yes? So if I told you the story, Jesus loved us so much that he died on the cross to save us from our sins. Is that understandable? Yeah. But when we talk about John Cena loved us so much that he ran on the dog to save us from our McDonald's, that's sometimes what we sound like to people. <laughs> when we're trying to tell them how much Jesus loves them and that he died on the cross to save them from their sins. We'd be so much more productive if we would get comfortable in sharing our stories. We would, get more, we would be more effective if we would use language that people can connect with without changing the gospel, 
never change it. We never water it down. We never soft sell it. But we can make it understandable and relatable and engaging when we practice. First, we have to really know it and experience it. But then practice your story. Practice the story of the gospel so that when you're anywhere, like the Bible instructs us to do, be prepared in and out of season to share the gospel with others. Thank you.
this morning. Praise you, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Yeah. 
be seated, except me. I'll go ahead and stand up. Romans chapter 8. Didn't Rhonda really look beautiful today? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Sorry, Bill. You're with me, dude. We don't even have a carpet. Romans chapter 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Aren't you glad of that? King James Version adds a little uh, clause to that. If you have the old King James Version, it will go on to say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It adds that, but it's really not there. In the Greek, it is not there. They did that later on to explain about there is no, therefore, no condemnation. I'm glad they actually added it because we'll see why that is important in just a little bit. It's your turn to read verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. No condemnation. The trial's over. Not guilty. Those words were what the incarcerated inmates wish they would have heard, but did not hear. The jury came back and said, guilty. Guilty as charged. Now, in the federal system, I, I heard enough of the inmates come up and, and talk to me, and they said, I, I would ask them, how much time do you have? And they go, well, they gave me uh, 20 years, but the lawyer says, I have a great chance on appeal. And I said to them, all that means is the lawyer thinks you have $5,000 more that he wants. So very, very few ever get out on appeal in the federal system. Not guilty. So today I want to talk about how Paul tells us we're not guilty and see how that came about. He says there's no condemnation. We don't have to deal with the crime anymore. But we do have to deal with the problem first before we go any further. The crime will be revealed soon enough. We will not be able to get through the entire chapter. This, this chapter is chucked full of all kinds of theological uh, need for explanation. It, it, it talks about inheritance. It talks about loss of one's salvation. It talks about predestination. It talks about election. So we have a lot to cover. We have until 1.30 uh, before the Latinos come in. No, we'll break it down. Do you remember last uh, week we did the eye doctor test? I need us to go through it one more time uh, quickly, as Paula emphasized, quickly. I want us to go through it again because I have, I need you to see something a little bit different this time. So I will start off, I will read the white, and you will read the yellow. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? I know that nothing good dwells in me. The willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For the good I want, to want, I do not, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Therefore, 
do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. Our old self was crucified, no longer slaves to sin. Wretched man that I am. Quick. Oh. Wretched man that I am. Uh, who will set me free from the body of this death? You see, last week we came to the conclusion of which is it that is a normal Christian? Is it the Roman 6 version or the Roman 7 version, 14 through 24? Which one is it? We go with six. We go with the, the second lens. There are some Christians who say that is not true. The real honest Christian is the one who says, I am wretched. I am wrong. I am bad through and through. Everything I do, all the members of my body do nothing but sin. And so then they come to chapter 8, and they said, not guilty. No condemnation on all that I do. For over 400 years, the church fathers did not uh, dare attribute this passage of Scripture to Paul's personal testimony. It all changed with Augustine who struggled with sexual sin, and he said, you know, that, that sounds a lot more like me, uh, Romans 7, than it does Romans 6. So let's say that Romans 7 is the Christian, and Romans 8 says there's no condemnation even though you're uh, uh, bound to sin, that you're a slave to sin. There's no condemnation. Forget about it. Just, just forget about it. And that's why the old King James says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That was addition to not guilty. John Calvin followed Augustine and led the, and taught that Paul wrote about himself as a regenerated man in Romans 7. He said, he concluded, the children of God are kept captive in prison as long as they live. Think about that. Captive in prison. Really? Captive in prison? You're in prison but not guilty? All the years, click. Paul, along with all the Christians, remain in prison? Really? We remain inmates but are not guilty? Really? How is that good news? I never met an inmate who said, I am not guilty, but I'm happy to be in prison. Never found one. They all whined and, and complained that I, I, I am not guilty. I shouldn't be here. They even know. That a Christian, that's not good news. That we're captive in prison, but not guilty. Isn't that good news? You stay right there. 
three hots in a cot. What more do you want? So in other words, the Christian lives in Romans 7, but the eternal consequences are removed in 8. One of the theologians said that man is a sad sack. In other words, wretched man, even after conversion, but not guilty. Barabbas was freed. Barabbas was freed. But what we don't know is what happened after he was freed. He didn't have to go to the cross that day. He was found not guilty. But we knew very well he was guilty. You know, there's some people that get off uh, a prison system or they get out, and we know they were guilty. And yet, the jury said, not guilty. Not guilty. Romans 8, verse 4. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is uh, the not ver guilty verdict. Someone inside a prison, not guilty. And so now we, we have a get out of jail free card but we're left in prison. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says we are released so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. And there is the clause who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I have a pet peeve. It might not surprise you. I have many of them. Starts with a B and ends with an Austin. I have many. Not Austin, Austin. Start with a B and go with it. Pet peeves. One of my pet peeves... I heard from a Nazarene pulpit that I just could not believe that I was listening to a Nazarene say this. Here's the pet peeve. That we somehow have two natures inside of us. And somehow we have, what do you see up there? You see the two wolves. We do not have two wolves inside of us. We don't have two dogs and the one that you feed grows the larger and the one that you don't feed gets smaller. We do not have have two natures within us. We are either sinners or we are saints. We are not sinners and saints at the same time. Are you with me? We do not believe that we are a split personality. We believe that God can make us holy through and through. And if the Holy Spirit is living within us, we do not have any demons. 
We believe in a pure heart, a righteous character. Okay, I'll calm down. Carly talks with me on the way back. You can go to that picture. I don't know how many of you have ever read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Stevenson. But I actually read it, and it's a lot different than the movies. And in the book, it shows chapter after chapter and clause after clause that says that Mr. Hyde, the one that goes out and kills the women, the one that has evil in his heart, the one that is, is hidden behind a mask of Dr. Jekyll. It does not mean that they are two different people. They are one person, and the real person is Dr. Hyde, or I mean Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde finally comes out at the end, and he says, now I can finally reveal who I really am. I want you to know we do not have two dogs within us. We do not have two natures. You're either a saint or you're a sinner. You cannot be both. And when a Christian sins, there is something within that says, before the night goes down, I must make everything right again. That is how it goes. It doesn't sit and fester. Do not let the root of bitterness begin in your heart. It says, take care of it. I said I'd be quiet. Why well, wouldn't be quiet? You see, we do not believe in the split personality. John and Charles Wesley. Go to the next one. Charles Wesley wrote his, his testimony down and put it to song. Bill, you could have sang your whole thing. Did a great job. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eyes diffuse a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. That did not make number one song in the in the United Methodist hymnal. Do you know what the number one song in the hymnal of the United Methodist was? It had 18 verses, and we'll sing all 18 verses today. Do you know what it was? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. 
I want you to look at that. He breaks the power of sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Now tell me, is that correct? I left one word out. Now Carolyn's going to look at the hymnal and see what it is because she does that. When I say, don't look at the hymnal, don't look at the, at the Bible, and she goes right to it. Spencer, you can control her, but when she's alone. So what word is, is missing? He breaks the power of sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Isn't that great? Isn't that a wonderful, but there's something missing. Carly? He breaks the power of canceled sin. Canceled sin? Why not just say he breaks the power of sin? He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. You see... Even when you're a Christian, you have these loops that go in your head all the time that remind you of things that you've done in the past that drive you crazy. You say, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe. Why would I ever even contemplate that? And so you sit here on a Sunday and you think, oh, I have done some rotten things. But aren't you glad that he breaks even those sins? The ones that have been canceled sins. The ones that we no longer have to pay for. The ones that have been taken away and forgotten by God. Now we have canceled sin that has been taken away. Number one song. Carly, I'm going to have to jump ahead. Be ready for me. Romans 8, 3b says that he condemns sin in the flesh. That's kind of an interesting thing. Sin was condemned in the flesh. It's almost like sin is a person. And for some reason, it's been condemned in the flesh. That means that God is condemning the sin, but not the sinner. He is saying, I hate that you were involved with that because it was ruining your life. And now he attacks the sin, but not the sinner. Boy, that's pretty good preaching there, Pastor. You're doing okay. We might keep you for another two or three weeks. For the law of the sin, the law of the, of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul introduces this new law that now is, is there. It is, 
It has taken the place of the old law. Now you have a new law, and that is the law of the Spirit. The old law taught you how to march. This is going to teach you how to dance. You will do things that you never thought you could do before. You will be uh, uh, loving people you never thought you could love before. You will be doing things and dancing like the Holy Spirit is so alive in yourself that it, He is living and not you because we have been crucified in Christ. And it's not I who live, but you live in me. You're getting a little excited up here. You have to calm down. There's a new law. Isaiah 29, verse 13. You read that to me. Can you find it? Then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. I'm afraid that we, we do that. We have a tendency to come in, sit down, sing our three hymns, hear a part of a sermon, the other part we kind of tune out on. We've learned by rote how to walk in, how to sit, how to sing, and then we've learned how to get out of here as quick as possible. We've learned things by rote. That's doing something over and over and over again. Marching is rote. Marching is marching in a straight line because you can start doing that and forget about everything else. The hour has arrived, and Jesus was talking about it. We need to prepare our hearts for communion. Pastor Paula is going to lead us in it. I leave you with this last verse about the hour that is now on us. But an hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So we worship with communion, a sacred moment, a time that we worship him in spirit and in truth.